I want to greet all of our campuses and those who are watching online. And, uh, you know, I am having so much fun uh, visiting all of our campuses. As I mentioned about a month ago, we now have more members of our church family not at Lake Forest than we do at Lake Forest. And so I've been traveling all around visiting each of our campuses uh, every week, and that's been a whole lot of fun. Recently, I, I, somebody wrote me this on Facebook. Pastor Rick, I've walked down many roads searching for happiness, but nothing is ever as good as it promises to be. I'm frustrated. I just want to be happy. Can you help me? And I would say to that person, if you're watching online right now, absolutely, I can help you. I want to start this series by giving you what I call five laws of happiness. And I apologize that I didn't put space in your outline for this. So you're just going to have to write on the sides, up down the edge, because it's not on your outline. I added this after I wrote the outline. But I thought it would be a good introduction to this series that we're going to begin this week. Five laws of happiness. When somebody says, I, I've been searching for happiness, I've been looking for happiness, I want to find happiness, this is what I tell them. Number one, don't look for happiness. Create it. Happiness is not something you look for. Happiness is something you create. And it's your choice. You're as happy as you choose to be. And actually, it's quite easy to create it, and we're going to be looking at it in this series. Number two, happiness is not a goal. Happiness is not a goal. It's actually the result of right thinking, right living, right acting. It's the byproduct. If you make happiness the goal of your life, you're going to live a very self-centered life. And that's going to end up making you miserable. Making happiness the goal of your life will guarantee that you're never going to be happy. Happy is ne happiness is never the goal. It is always the result, it's always the byproduct of something else. And so if you make it your goal, you're gonna be miserable. Number three, my habits create my happiness. My habits create my happiness. Happiness is a choice. We shape our habits and then they shape us. And we're gonna look at this in detail in this new series, how we shape our habits and then our habits shape us. And you can create the habits of happiness in your life. Number four, fourth law. Happiness based on happenings is temporary. But happiness built on habits is long lasting. I'll say it again. Happiness that is built on happenings is temporary. I go to Disneyland, I'm happy. I come out, realize how much money I spend, I'm not happy. I have the happiness of going to see a movie everybody's telling me is great, it's not so great, I come out not happy, disappointed. Anything where, that, where you base your happiness on a happening, on a circumstance, on an occasion, as soon as the occasion's over, you lose your happiness. So you don't want that. Happiness based on happenings is short term, it's temporary. Happiness based on habits is long term, and you can be happy the rest of your life. And number five, fifth law is this. Happy habits are as addicting as bad habits, but they're a whole lot more rewarding. There aren't the negatives that are given to bad habits. Now, bad habits take some time to develop. You don't develop them overnight. And the same thing with good habits. You don't develop them overnight. But happiness and the habits of happiness can be developed so that they become habitual in your life. Now, this weekend, we're beginning this new series I'm calling The Habits of of happiness. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through the book of Philippians, verse by verse through the books, uh, through the chapters of, of Philippians. Now Philippians is a, is a great book. It's the happiest book in the Bible. The word joy, the word glad, the word enjoy, the word rejoice, the, uh, the word happy, hap happiness. The, these words there are used in various forms 17 times in a very short book. It's the happiest book in the Bible. It was written by Paul, and what's amazing is that this happiest book in the Bible is written by Paul while he's in prison in Rome, which means your happiness isn't based on your happenings or your happenstances. And actually what this book is, is a thank you note. 
Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, which is a city in Greece, that he started, he planted. He's now in prison in Rome, and he's writing to thank them. He's thanking them for financial gifts that they've given to him. He's uh, thanking them for their prayers, for their support, for their love, all these things. And it's, it's actually the most personal book in the Bible. And we're gonna look at it together for the next 12 weeks as we go verse by verse through the book of Philippians. Now, I wanna encourage you to bring your Bible with you because you can mark it up as we go straight through the chapters like we do this. If you wanna be happy, where do you start? I mean, really, what would you start with? Money, sex, time? What, what would you start with if you say, we need to learn how to be really happy in life? Paul starts with relationships with relationships. It is impossible to be happy while your relationships are unhappy. Everybody agree with that? I mean, you can meet all kinds of people, they got all kinds of money, they've got all kinds of fame, they've got every kind of pleasure you can imagine, but if they're in the middle of a divorce, they're not happy. If your relationships are unhappy, your life is going to be unhappy. So Paul, when he starts talking about uh, and modeling the habits of happiness, he begins right off the bat, the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter one, talking about how do you have happy relationships? How do you have healthy relationships? So we've gotta start here before we can go anywhere else in the habits of happiness. Now in the first 11 verses, Paul makes his description of his relationship. He describes his relationship to the people of Philippi, and he gives us four statements. And we're gonna come back and look at these as habits you can develop to have healthier, happier relationships. Let me read it to you, Philippians chapter one. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ. It's written to all of God's people in Philippi who believe in Jesus Christ, and the elders and the deacons of the church. May God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. That's his introduction, now he gets into his first subject. He says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. I always pray for you, and I make my request with a heart full of joy, because you've been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am confident that God, who began this good work within you, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ comes back again. Now it's right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a very special place in my heart. We've shared together the blessings of God, both when I was in prison, when I was out, defending the truth and telling others the good news. And God knows how much I love you and how I long for you. Can't you see the personal nature of this book? How much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. And I pray that your love for each other will overflow more and more. And I pray that you will keep on growing in your knowledge and understanding, for I want you to understand what really matters. So that you may live pure and blameless lives until Christ returns. And may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation those good things that are produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Now in the first 11 verses of uh, Philippians, Paul models four relational habits that if you will just practice these things, your relationships will be more enjoyable and your happiness will be greater. They are easy to explain, they are simple to understand, but they are incredibly hard to do. Because when I tell you these, you go, oh yeah, I know this, I know this, but you don't do it. <laughs> and so although it's easy for me to teach them, it's very hard for all of us to practice them. But if you will do these four relational habits, and you'll build them in your life, you, your relationships will be transformed and you'll be happy. All right, let's look at it. First, number one, to be happy, the first thing Paul says is this, I must be grateful for the people in my life. I must be grateful 
for the people in my life. Study after study after study after study after study link gratitude to happiness. It's been proven over and over by psychologists, sociologists, and others that the more grateful you are, the more happy you are. The more ungrateful you are, the more unhappy you are. And if you want to have good relationships, you start with the attitude of gratitude. You will be far happier, you will enjoy your relationships more if you will develop the habit of being grateful for the people in your life. The habit of being grateful for the people in your life. Philippians chapter one, verse three, Paul starts off with this, this very first thing. Every time I think of you, now remember, he's in Rome, they're in a city called Philippi. Every time I think of you, I give thanks. I give thanks to my God. Paul says, you know what? I remember the good things about you, and I focus on the good times we've had. Friends, that simple truth right there is, is, is the source of good relationships. And when marriages stop doing this, they crumble. When you stop remembering why you got married in the first place, what attracted you to that person, when you stop remembering the good times, when you stop being grateful for your mate, your marriage is already on a long slide into oblivion. Paul says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to God for you. Let me ask you, just be real honest. When you think of the people in your life, do you automatically, is your first thought gratitude? No, it's not. No, it's what do they need to do for me? Are they late? Are they in a hurry? Uh, what's not right? What have we had a problem with? What do we gotta get done? Your first thought is not gratitude. Paul says, when I think of you, the first thing I do is I think of gratitude. I'm grateful for who you are. I'm grateful for what you've done. Now, it, it, here's the problem with this. There pro the problem with this is the longer you know someone, number one, you take them, the more you take them for granted. Isn't that true? The longer you know someone, the more you take them for granted. The more you focus on their faults, and the easier it is to remember bad times. I don't know why it is, but it's easier to remember bad times than it is happy times. Paul says, every time I think of you, I give thanks. If you would just develop this habit that whenever you think of the people in your life, your friends, your neighbors, your husband, your wife, your kids, your relatives, whatever, that the first thought is gratitude, it's gonna change your relationship. Now that's a habit you have to develop. It does not come natural. We are not by nature grateful people. We are by nature discontented people. We are by nature always wanting more, wanting things to be different. Philippians chapter one verse five, Paul says it again. I thank God. I thank God for the help that you gave me. Now, if you know the story of, of this church that he started there, there was a woman named Lydia who was a businesswoman who opened up her home. And he says, from the very first day, you, you welcomed us. And you helped us from the very first day. And then, as I said, several times in Paul's travels, the Philippian church was funding Paul's missionary journeys. And in this particular instance, they had sent a man named Epaphroditus all the way to Rome to bring him a financial gift because Paul was in Rome by himself in prison. And Epaphroditus had nearly died on the way. We'll get to that later in the book. And now Paul is sending him back with this thank you note to the, to the people in Philippi. And he says, I thank God for the help you gave me. I just wonder, what is it that you have forgotten that other people have done for you? Again, the longer you know someone, the more you take them for granted. The more you look for their faults. And the more it's easier to remember the bad things than the good things. See, the truth is about Paul and Philippi, he didn't have a good time in Philippi. In fact, it was one of his roughest churches getting started. But you don't get any of that in this letter. The fact is, when Paul went to this city to start a church, he was beaten, he was whipped, he was humiliated, he was falsely arrested, he was thrown in a prison, he went through an earthquake, and then he was politely asked by the city leaders to leave town. When I thank God for you, I, I think of you, I thank God for you. What is he doing? He is choosing selective memory. This was not a happy place all the time. It wasn't all sunshine and lollipops and roses and rainbows and my little pony. It was a lot of bad stuff that happened. 
but Paul chose not to dwell on painful memories. Are you still living some painful memories with some people in your life you've never let them off the hook? And you can't enjoy a relationship because you're still holding on to the past. Would you write this down? Memories are a choice. Memories are a choice. I remember hearing a story one time about two women talking and uh, one of the wives said to the other wife said, don't you remember that time when your husband did da 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 da? And she said, I distinctly remember forgetting that. <laughs> That's a choice. Your memories are a choice. Now if you wanna hold on to your painful memories, go right ahead, but you're not gonna be happy. Paul had a lot of reasons to have painful memories in Philippi. It was not a happy time for everything that happened there. As I said, beaten, maligned, and all these things. But he says, every time I think of you, I thank God for you. He's choosing to be grateful for the people in his life. Now, in this series, I'm gonna give you what I call happiness hints. And I'm gonna put a little HH next to, the, uh, next to these happiness hints. And here's the first one I get, wanna give you in the whole series. Remember the best and forget the rest. If you wanna be happy, Remember the best and forget the rest. Develop selective memory. By the way, September 21 is World Gratitude Day. Did you know that? It's World Gratitude Day, according to the United Nations. So here's my assignment for you this weekend. I want you to go home, make a list of the people in your life, and write down five or 10 things you can say, I'm really grateful for these things in their lives. It's the first habit. The attitude of gratitude will transform your relationship. If you're not grateful, you're gonna have all kinds of complaining, worrying, all kinds of other things. I've gotta be grateful for the people in my life. Number two, the second habit of happiness in relational happiness is this. I need to not only be grateful for the people in my life, I need to pray with joy for the people in my life. I need to pray joyfully. I need to pray with joy for the people in my life. Now Paul is praying, as we just read this passage, praying for these people. How would you like to have the Apostle Paul praying for you? You think that would help? The guy who wrote much of the New Testament? Wouldn't you like, don't you know those Philippians thought, hey, this is pretty cool, Paul is praying for us. Doesn't it encourage you to know when, when somebody is praying for you? Yes, yes it does. It encourages you. In fact, the thing that keeps me going is your prayers. And when people say, I'm praying for you, Pastor Rick, I take that serious because it's what I move on. It is that power that I move on. Paul says in verse four, he says this, I always pray for you. Now that's part of it, but notice the rest of the verse. And I make my request, when he's praying for you, he says, with a heart full of joy. Now I want you to just a minute, think of somebody who irritates you. Don't look at them, just think of them. <laughs> okay? Maybe somebody you've got a strained relationship with or they just kind of rub you the wrong way. I have two questions for you. Number one, do you pray for them? Okay, do, do you pray for it, or do you just complain and grumble and nag and nitpick? If you prayed more, you'd have a lot less to grumble, complain, nag, and nitpick about. So you can decide, does nagging work? No. Does prayer work? Yes. So why do you do more of the thing that doesn't work than does? Paul says, I pray for you and you need to pray for the people in your life. But then he says, I pray for you making requests with a heart full of joy. When you do pray, do you pray with joy? And let me give you a little secret here. There are things in people's lives around you you'd like to change. You don't want to change yourself, you want them to change. If she would just do this, if she would just do that, if he would just do this. And, and we always want to change other people. You can't. You can't change anybody. You cannot change anybody. They can only change themselves and you can only change yourself. So all of that, trying to change your, your change program doesn't work. But you can pray and God can change people. 
You might write this down. Positive praying is more effective than positive thinking. You know, people read all these books about positive thinking. Well, okay, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I'm sure I'd rather have you thinking positively than negatively. But, but all the positive thinking in the world isn't going to change your husband or your wife or your child or your friend or your situation. Positive thinking is not enough. Positive thinking can change you, but it can't change somebody else. But positive prayer can so positive prayer is more powerful than positive thinking. So I want you to write this down. Here's my little happiness hint. The quickest way to change a bad relationship to a good one, the quickest way, start praying for them. Start praying for them. It'll change you and it can change them. Start praying for them. You say, well, what do I pray? Well, I would encourage you to pray what Paul prayed. And in verses nine to 11, we have what Paul prayed. Here's what he says, and this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and that you may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, and that you may be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What does he say? Four things you can pray, write these down. Four things. Pray, and I, I would say pray these for your kids, pray these for your friends, Pray these for your boyfriend, your girlfriend. Pray these for your boss. Pray these for me. Anybody you care about. Pray with joy for the people in your life. And you pray these four things. First, pray they will grow in love. Pray that they will grow in love. Paul says that your love will grow more and more. Number two, he says pray that they will make wise choices. Pray that the people in your life, in your family, in your friends, in your neighbor, pray that they will make wise choices. Verse nine and 10 says that you will know and fully, fully know and understand how to make the right choices. Third thing to pray for the people in your life. Pray they will live with integrity. Pray that they will live with integrity. Paul says, I pray that you may live pure and blameless lives until Christ returns. And the fourth thing to pray is pray that they will become like Jesus. Parents, there's your prayer agenda right there. Husbands, wives, friends, there's your prayer agenda right there. Pray that they will become like Christ. Verse 11, that you will be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Circle the word fruit. What's he, what fruit's he talking about there? Well, we call it the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is the character of Jesus. In Galatians 5, and 23 says this. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. The fruit of the Spirit is goodness and faithfulness. It's, the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness and self-control. What is that? It's a perfect picture of Jesus. Now, these four things, you can pray them for me any day of the week. Pray that I will grow in love. Pray that I will make wise choices. Pray that I will live with integrity. Pray that I will become more and more like Jesus. You can pray these for yourself. You can pray these for your spouse. And you know what? You can know they will be answered. Why? Because they're in the Bible. This is not a prayer you go, if it's your will, God. This is God's will. It's in the Bible. So you know God wants to answer that prayer. So the first thing I do, I have to be grateful for the people in my life, and second, I have to pray, and actually pray joyfully. Not with complaining, not with criticism, like, oh God, why can't you get this man and mine in shape? That's not praying joyfully. That's praying whinily, <laughs> crankily. No, pray joyfully. And here's what you pray. Number three, here's the third habit, Paul says, and it's in the next verse. I must expect the best from people in my life. I must expect the best. Now these things are so simple for me to teach you, but they are so hard to turn into habits. We don't normally expect the best from the people around us. We expect the worst. We expect them to let us down because we have a track record. Now, 
he's saying you want to make a habit of believing in people rather than criticizing them. Expect the best. Philippians 1 and then verse 6 is the next verse. He says this. I am confident of this, that God, who began a good work in you, will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now circle the word confident. I am confident of this, that God who began the good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I'm expecting the best from the people in my life. Now Paul is a pro at bringing out the best in people. And I wanna teach you how to do it right now. There are three things that you do to bring out the best in people. And Paul does all three of them in this verse. He says, here's how I bring out the best people. Number one, you just write this down, he believed in people. He believed in people. He says, I am confident. And he gave them confidence. Do you give the people in your life confidence or do you tear them down? Do you build them up or do you tear them down? Do you give the people in your life confidence? You know, uh, in the last series I gave you an illustration about what a good parent does when a child stumbles. Remember I said, if a child is running a race and you're at the track watching them run a race at school and all of a sudden they really mess up and they stumble and they fall flat on their face and they embarrass themselves and you're in the stand as a parent, what do you do? You don't get up and say, oh, I'm so embarrassed, I'm leaving. You know, how pathetic you are. You don't, you, a bad parent would do that. But what does a good parent do? A, a good parent stands up and yells even more. You can do this. Get up, I believe in you, I know you can do it. Come on, come on, get up. I know you can, this is just a minor thing. No, don't worry about it, don't worry about anybody else. Just keep on running. That's what God does with you when you stumble. That's what God wants you to do with people in your life when they stumble. That's what it means to be like Jesus. Paul says, I believe in people. I, I give them confidence. I help them grow. I am confident that what God has started in your life, he's gonna continue to do. You see, we all need people to believe in us because it's how we change. You can't change unless somebody believes in you and you believe in yourself. Acceptance always precedes transformation. That's why I always say, you know, don't tell it like it is. Tell it like it could be. Sometimes, you know, I train pastors in preaching. And sometimes pastors say, well, I just tell it like it is. I say, well, okay. But that doesn't change anybody. Tell it like it could be is preaching for faith. I could get up here and say, you know, you're all not doing a good job. And I could tell you all the areas you're not doing a good job in. And what would it do? It'd just make you defensive. It wouldn't change you one bit. And next week you go, oh, let's go back and have Rick whip us some more. <laughs> some, some people actually are spiritual masochists. Oh, pastor, that's such a great sermon. It made me feel so bad. I'm going, what? <laughs> no, no, that's not it. Nobody changes by nagging. It doesn't happen in the pulpit or anywhere else. So don't tell it like it is. Tell it like it could be. If I help draw a picture, say, this is what you could become. This is what you could be with God's power in your life. Then you get excited. Paul says, I'm confident, I believe in you. The second thing he did is he gave people vision. And the vision was, you're gonna keep growing. God's not gonna, what God starts, he finishes. He's not gonna leave you halfway out there. He gave people vision. He painted a picture of the future. Now why is that important? Because study after study after study shows that we tend to live up to the expectations of other people. When people expect the best of you, you tend to do better. When teachers expect the best of their students, they always perform better than teachers who don't expect the best from their students. That has been proven over and over again in studies. That we tend to become what we believe the most important people in our lives think about us. So Paul says, I, 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 I expect the best from people, I believe in people, I give people vision. And the third thing, this is really important, you write this down from this verse, he was patient with people's progress. I am confident that what God's began in you, he's gonna keep on and he's gonna carry it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He was patient with people's progress. 
Now, why is that so important to your happiness? I'll tell you why. If you insist on perfection in people, you're going to be miserable the rest of your life. Because there's nobody perfect, especially you. And if you're always expecting perfection in people before you can enjoy them, then you're never going to be happy because nobody's perfect. Paul says, I am patient with people's progress. Now let me give you a little happiness hint on this one. You write this one down. If you want to really be happy in your relationships, if you want to have happier relationships, healthier relationships, celebrate how far people have come rather than judging them for how much they still have to go. Celebrate people for how far they've come rather than judging how far they still have to go. You gotta be patient with people's progress. When my kids were little, they would draw me pictures and they'd bring it to me and they'd say, what do you think of this, Daddy? And I would say, that's perfect, Amy. That's perfect, Josh. That's perfect, Matthew. It looks great. And when I said that perfect, did I mean it was a Picasso? No, it was perfect for that stage in their life. God doesn't wait until you're mature for him to start loving you. So you shouldn't do that with others either. You gotta love them more than all. You gotta be patient with their progress. Now, what is the key to patience? How do, I, how do I celebrate how far people have come rather than judging how far they still have to go? The key to patience is love. And Paul says in the next verse, verse seven, it is right for me to feel this way. In other words, I expect the best from you. It's right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. Circle that phrase, in my heart. This is a real key to happiness and it's a real key to healthy relationships. You gotta have people in your heart. You know what I've discovered? If people aren't on my heart, they're on my nerves. <laughs> and if I wanna get them off my nerves, I gotta get them on my heart. If I'm praying for somebody, they just don't bug me as much. They just don't bother me as much. If they're on my heart, they're not on my nerves. But if I'm not praying for them, I get perturbed by them pretty easily. He says, I have you in my heart. You see, so many of the relationship problems that you have, that you have over and over and over, is because we all tend to react with our head, not with our heart. And that's the wrong place to go in relationships. That's, you know, somebody comes to you, let's say, uh, men, let me talk to the men for a minute. Your wife comes to you and says, honey, this really frightens me, or this really worries me, this thing really concerns me. And you react, not with your heart, you react with your head and go, well, that's not logical, that's dumb, you shouldn't feel that way. Well, that was helpful. <laughs> now, that, 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 did that really build a bridge? No. No, it didn't at all, because you're reacting with your head rather than with your heart. When people say, and you've had people say this to you before, you just don't understand. You just don't understand. You just don't understand. They're not really talking about understanding. What they're really saying is, you don't feel my pain. You don't feel what I'm feeling. It has nothing to do with understanding. It has everything to do with empathy. You're not sympathetic, you're not empathetic, you don't care, you're not feeling my feelings. And say, so you don't understand, we try to logic it out. Say, so, well, let me understand it. No, it's not logic, it's, it's feelings. And feelings are just feelings, they're not right or wrong, they're just, they're just feelings. The last five months, I've been getting a PhD in learning empathy. And all of the things that we've been going through in our family. And what they're saying is, you, you don't feel it. So when Paul says, uh, I, I have you on my heart, loving from the heart begins with understanding. And it means you know why they tick, you know how they tick, and you don't judge them for ticking that way. You just listen, and you accept, and you listen, and you understand moods, and you respond accordingly. And that leads us to the fourth big habit. And this one is the granddaddy of them all. And Paul says, this is the fourth habit secret. 
I must love people in my life like Jesus does. I must love people in my life like Jesus does. I must be grateful for the people in life. I must pray for the people in my life with joy. I must expect the best from the people in my life and I must love people in my life like Jesus does. Now again, I told you, it's easy for me to teach it. It's incredibly hard for you to do this because you're not Jesus. And we tend to be self-centered. We tend to look at our own needs and, and all of the things that have happened in our life. But I've got to love people like Jesus does. In verse 8, here's the fourth thing Paul says about relational habits. God is my witness that I tell the truth when I say that my deep love for you, my deep love for you all, comes from the heart of Christ Jesus himself. I love this verse so much because I identify with it. You see, Paul started the Philippian church. He was the first member. He was the first pastor. And, and so I identify with how he felt about this church as I do about you. I want you to know that I am grateful for you, just like Paul was. I want you to know that I pray for you with joy. I want you to know that I believe in you, I have confidence in you. And I want you to know that it is an honor to serve you. You know, this week when Kay and I did that Pierce Morgan interview, it was interesting to me that the only time that I really lost it emotionally, I mean, I felt the whole interview, but the only time I really lost it emotionally was when I thought of you. Because Pierce um, asked me, he said, what was it like the first time back with your church family? And I will never forget that moment. And I told him, and some of you heard it who watched that interview, so I said, you know, for 33 years, Kay and I have given our lives for this church, for these people. We love them with all our hearts. We love them from the heart. I'm like Paul. I'm grateful for you. I'm like Paul. I, I pray for you with joy. I believe in you. I am confident that what God began in your life, he's going to finish. And I love you from the heart. And I said, we've given out for 33 years. And in that moment when we walked on the stage, you gave all 33 years back in one second. And I wish everyone could feel that kind of love just so deeply. And, uh, and I lost it. 1 John 3.16 says this. This is how we know what real love is. Christ gave his life for us. So then we ought to give our lives for who? For others. Now, what is that reference again? Look at it. What is it? It's 1 John 3.16. Does that remind you of any other verse? John 3.16. Same guy wrote both. You know what the problem with relationships is today? People who know John 3.16 ignore 1 John 3.16. We all know John 3.16. Most of you could quote it. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the way to salvation. It's the way to have past forgiven, purpose for living, home in heaven. God says, I sent my son. That's how much I love you. And we're all grateful for God's love for us, John 3.16. But we want to ignore 1 John 3.16. It says, and this is real love. God gave his life for us. He gave his son for us. And we must do the same thing. If we would do that, we would not have any relational problems. Because we wouldn't be thinking about ourselves. We'd be thinking about other people. Let's bow our heads. And as we close, I just want to ask you to do a little personal evaluation, whether you're watching online or at any of our campuses or here at Lake Forest. Which of these four habits do you need to work on? Who do you need to be more grateful for? 
Who in your life have you taken for granted? Who have you failed to appreciate? Who have you, because of their faults or flaws, you have not been grateful for them? That's the first habit of happiness. Be grateful for the people in my life. Number two, are you praying for the people in your life? And are you praying with joy or are you praying with complaining? God, fix that person. Are you praying with joy? I'm gonna encourage you to make a prayer list and write down some names and pray the four things that Paul prayed. That people will grow in love, that they will make wise choices, that they'll live with integrity, that they'll become like Jesus. Let me ask you this, are you patient with the progress of the people in your life? Or do you demand perfection? It's never good enough. As I said, if people have to be perfect for you to enjoy them, you're never gonna enjoy them. And number four, who do you need to start loving from the heart rather than from the head? Now in this series, we're going to talk about the habits of happiness. Desire will get you started, but the habits will keep you going. So I want you to first make a commitment to be a part of this series for all 12 weeks. And why don't you in your heart right now say, God, I really do want to be happy, and I want to learn the habits of happiness, and I commit to being a part and not missing any of this series, that I may learn the habits of happiness if you've never invited Christ to in your life, say, Jesus Christ, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. I don't understand it all, but I want to get to know you and I want to learn to love you back. And then, dear God, I ask you to give me the power to be grateful for the people in my life. Help me to remember the best and forget the rest. And on those bad relationships, help me to start praying for them and pray with joy. To pray that they grow in love and that they live with integrity, that they become like Jesus. Dear God, I, I want you to help me develop the habit of expecting the best from the people of my life rather than criticizing the worst. Help me to believe in people. Help me to be confident and build confidence. Help me to be patient with people's progress. Help me to look, recognize how far people have come, not how far they still have to go. And dear God, help me to have love in my heart and to love people not from the head. Men, who, you guys who are married, say, God, help me to love my wife from my heart, not from my head. And help me to love people in my life like Jesus does, that I would be willing to lay down my life in sacrifice or in service. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.